Hola, buenos días a, a Medellín, Colombia. Hola, what's up? Today is our first full day here in Medellin. We're going to be headed up to a graffiti tour. So on the way, we're going to be hearing about Pablo Escobar and Las Carrillas. Dad, I gotta give you a little context sí. of Medellin. Cool. So let's talk. Well, let's go way back to, to the fifties. In the fifties, nineteen fifties was when the guerrillas started getting created in Medellin, in, sorry, in Colombia, right? So guerrillas are illegal armed groups, right? Revolutionary groups, forces that at the beginning they were created as an opposition for the government, right? We have been in the power of the right wing for more than 60 years, right? So at that point, since the very beginning, and still today, it was very corrupt, right? So. Um, vicious cycles that they were creating, for example, uh, political power making, giving a lot of tax breaks, for example, to the economic power, and then the economic power making sure to re-elect them. So it was a vicious cycle right there, right there. And of course, all of those tax breaks, where they were coming from, our pockets, right? The regular people pockets. So that was the situation for a long time. In the 50s, the guerrillas started getting created as a way of protest or give some opposition or they were claiming that they were fighting for the rights of the people of the countryside for example right but contradictory they were the ones that actually brought violence to the countryside they were doing that in a violent way and unfortunately conflict started getting created from that point 50s right in the 70s a lot of the guerrillas uh, were taking a lot of control of the rural areas in Colombia right and the phenomenon of forced displacement started happening a lot, right? People from the countryside that were being kicked out of their houses by the guerrillas. They had to come to the cities looking for other options, you know? They didn't have any other option. They, either they will run or they will get killed. So uh, they started coming into the cities. In the 70s was when Medellin started growing a lot as a city. A lot of people started coming in. People that didn't have resources, you know, they came with whatever they could carry. And there were no places for them inside of the valley, right? Or they didn't have the resources to get a place inside of the valley. So they started going up to the peripheral regions. And they started taking piece of pieces of land and building their houses with whatever they could. This was known as invasions. And it was an illegal practice. They didn't own the land, but they just took it, right? Because it was illegal, considered illegal, the local government at the beginning were like, nope, these people are not my problem. They are not part of the city. I really don't care about them, right? That's when the absence of the government, the absence of the local government in those places gave room for other actors to take advantage and take control of those places, right? So let's go, let's keep going to the 80s, right? I'm sure you've heard of this guy, right? Exactly. So the 80s was his prime time. At that moment, he was already the most powerful person of Colombia. How was it that he got to that position? Well, he started controlling the city, taking advantage of that necessity that people used to do. So people living in the, let's, let's put yourself in that position. You came from the countryside displaced by violence, right? You came with your whole family. You have to provide for them. You go up there, you build a house with whatever you could. So we're talking wood houses, plastic, even just mud houses, right? And if you wanted to have a job, you will have to walk down to a point where you can get some transportation, then pay for the bus, then pay for the train, depending on where you're going, two different payments. And then the way back, four, they didn't have those resources. So that was not an option. If you don't have access to a job, you have a family to provide for. And then a guy comes in and tells you, hey, you know what? I'll give you money if you take this weapon. Just take it. You'll do it, right? I'll give you more money if you join this gang. I'll give you more money if you kill this person. You know, ultimately you will do it. And that is, like roughly, how Pablo started taking control all over the city. Where did it, he have his money from to be able to afford to do this? Okay, so at that point he was already the narco deal, the big narco dealer in the biggest one in the world, right? So he, at the beginning of the 80s, that's when he like started creating the whole business. He started with 
I mean, he was from the countryside, you know. A, a lady was the one that got his uh, ability, you know. Uh, his we call it labia, which means like his ability to talk and maybe uh, deceive you a little bit with with your speaking, you know. Um, and she was the one that got him into the narco traffic business at the beginning with marijuana. He started like a smuggler, you know, just smuggling illegal merchandise. I said Jumbo, see, sí, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Where was it? <laughs> 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 yes. So he started smuggling merchandise. Then he got into the narco traffic business, specifically with marijuana, because this lady got him into it, right? And he was the one that actually kind of created the whole narco traffic business with cocaine, mm -hmm. specifically, right? Yes. Uh, at that point, he was already running the business. He created the whole, like, roots, for example, the whole uh, business context, whatever he needed to. I mean, he created the whole system, right? Yeah, at that point, he was already that person. He had already a lot of money. Look, guys, his biggest challenge during his whole life was how to move the money. Because one plane of drugs meant three planes of cash. And I mean, for you to manage that amount of cash, that's why uh, some of the images that you have from him is him just throwing away money from the window of his car. Or, And I mean, he claimed that he was providing job opportunities. He claimed that he was helping people. But I mean, what kind of jobs, right? Yeah. They were training little children to become hitmen. And if you have a weapon in your hands, since you're, since you're five years old, then that's your reality. That's how the world works. That's just normal. I believe that's the biggest consequence that he left for the whole country, but specifically in Medellin. Because of him, violence became normal. Killing was easy. It was super easy. Just a bad look was reason enough for me to kill you. The value of life went to zero. Um, and it kind of took over the whole city. The peripheral regions were all kind of working for him. Um, and then he was also controlling the rest of the country through the guerrillas. So he was quite a businessman, you know. He started negotiating with the guerrillas. He said, look, I have my drug laboratories in the jungle. You live in the jungle, you know the place. Let's make some business. I can use some security for these places and you can use some money, right? Well, he started providing them with weapons, providing them with money, with power. They started working for him. You know, just the fact of aligning all of the guerrillas in one same objective, that was quite, mm -hmm. <laughs> quite a feat. Um, and then um, the guerrillas forgot whatever they were fighting for at the beginning. They forgot whatever they were creating for, and they just went in for the money, for the power, um, into the business, right? So 80s. Uh, at that moment, the city here in Medellin, they realized that these people in the peripheral regions, they were not going anywhere, right? They couldn't keep ignoring them. They started providing energy, you know, um, sewer system, water, all of these things, but not security. You know, of course, the security like entities at that moment were focusing on this guy, right? Um, but again, because they didn't have presence there, then things kept going as they were, right? Mm. Again, violence, people growing in that context, the value of life got to zero. Prime time of Paulo, the 80s, late 80s and early 90s was the most violent period of time of Colombia, right? The year 91 was when we got labeled as the most dangerous city in the world because we got that year we got to 9,000 assassinations in one city in one year, right? And the year 90 was not 9,000, but it was 8,000 and something. The year 89 was not 9,000, but 8,000 and something. So it was a very, very violent period of time. Um, I mean, just to give you an idea, the thing is that at that point in the early 90s was when violence moved from the countryside from the rest of the country into the big cities so this was the first time that people in the big cities privileged people you know people with money with resources were touched by this war you know so that was the moment when it became real for them for them uh,
Pablo started destroying the symbol of security from within. What is the symbol of security in a city? What is it? Of safety. The police force, exactly. So he has started destroying the police force from within. He has started offering bounties on policemen's heads. And it was a $2,000 bounty. And the higher the rank, the higher the bounty. It became a sport, it became a job opportunity to kill policemen. Uh, no one wanted to become a policeman, of course. So a lot of people were resigning, they, uh, the rest were being killed. And the one that remains, the ones that remained were corrupt. So it was a whole oh, shit show, right? I mean, there was no way for you so to... So he had basically total control over the country because he wiped out agree. all the police. Kind of. I mean, yes. He wiped out, yeah. wiped them out, or bought or them. Or he bought them out. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. He was... He was the most powerful person of Colombia and one of the most powerful people in the world. He wanted more. He said, how can I get more power? Well, I'm gonna become the president of Colombia. This was in the late 80s. Sorry, this was in the late 80s. I'm gonna become the president. He started pursuing a political career. In my opinion, his biggest mistake. Because that got him into the spotlight. And he was not subtle at all. So wherever he went, immediately he got the attention. He became a senator, a congressman, like legitimately, wow. like gotcha. legally. Maybe you've heard of him as a Colombian Robin Hood or maybe this kind of comments. I mean, wrong, completely wrong. The thing is that some of the things that you've heard, for example, he did build a whole neighborhood from scratch and gave it away for the poor people. He did went outside in his car throwing money out of his window. He did did some of these things, right? Not because he was such a nice guy, no because he needed the votes at that moment. He was already in that pursuit and he got the votes, you know? He become, became a senator, uh, but immediately everyone started wondering who that guy was. They found out who that guy was and they kicked him out of the Congress, like immediately. First time that things, something like that happened, but I mean, yeah, it was Pablo Escobar. So they kicked him out of the Congress and that's when he declared war directly to the national government. And he had the military power to do so. I mean, he was winning the war. He was winning the war. The national government was being humiliated. So again, early 90s, very violent. All over, I mean, if Medellin was the, um, his headquarters, then Bogota was the government headquarters. They both became a battlefield. It was super common for you to hear a car bomb any other day, a shooting any other day, um, just terrorist attacks just because. There was, there was no like an objective for the tourist attack. No, it was just to spread fear, to show power. I mean, it was pretty tough. It, well, I, I was born in 91. I didn't live through that, but my parents tell the story. So for example, my mom, she told me that the most dangerous thing that you could do at that moment was being inside of a policeman or driving inside of a police car. Because at any minute it would blow up. And if you're right there, I'm sorry. You know, so just that, it messes with your head. The fact that the symbol of security becomes the most dangerous thing for you to be a side of. I mean, that's pretty, pretty crazy. So, um, well, this was like that for a long time. Um, he started like losing force when the United States got involved. Of course, right? A lot of military resources started coming in from the United States. And that's when the national government was kind of able to fight back, you know, they started hitting him hard, you know, destroying drug laboratories. He was willing to fight. I mean, he was not letting that go. But his family was in a different page. You know, he was always with the idea of never leaving Medellin because this was his place. He was not, I mean, a lot of people told him to go to a different place, manage operations from a different place. He was never a fan of that idea. And his family was with him until uh, the government started fighting back and they started receiving like big hits. Then his family started getting afraid. And his wife said, no, I'm leaving. I mean, you can say I'm living with my children. They went to Germany, but immediately at the airport, they were being waited. <laughs> they immediately deported them here the government took him, right? Took him. And then that's when Pablo started going a little bit in decline. Um, yeah, I mean, the last couple of years of his life, he was just running away, hiding away with three of his, bo of his bodyguards. One afternoon in 93, he was tired of hiding. He went for a walk to a park 
somebody recognized him and followed him. And in that night, the whole operation to capture him, no one wanted to capture him. Everyone wanted him dead. And yes, that's exactly what happened. Two of his bodyguards were killed, the other one was um, taken, and then he tried to flee through a rooftop, you know, through a window, running barefoot on a rooftop, and that's when he was shot. There's a whole thing with that image, you know, they, they kind of took a picture with his body as a trophy, it was pretty gross, and then uh, we have artists making paintings of his dead, Botero, we're gonna talk about Botero in a minute, and he has two paintings of his dead, one when he's been shot, one when he's already lying down, so yeah, it became a thing, and it's actually close to, <laughs> it was close to your hotel, that's where the whole thing actually happened, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's where he was like, so, um, well, I don't think that the local gov that the government was that naive to think that killing Pablo was the solution for everything, because that was it was not right. After Pablo's death, violence actually increased a lot. It pe it peaked, and it was. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, everyone started fighting over who was gonna take that position, right? Who was gonna be the next leader? Then the guerrillas always the, also they were left with no leader. And then the guerrillas just started fighting amongst each other for control of territory, control of business, right? So violence never stopped. It moved back to the countryside. It moved to other cities, for example, Cali, because the Cali's cartel ultimately were the ones that took over. Uh, but it never stopped. In the 90s, that's when the local government started realizing they needed to do something. We were left with what we called the narco culture, the biggest consequence of it, right? So violence as a normal thing, life as a as zero value, um, I mean, guns as a negotiation tool. I mean, this kind of things became normal, became not only in the, in the narco traffic business side of it, in the rest of the spaces, it went so deep into our culture that sometimes it got also like um, how do you say that like inadverted you know you, you didn't even notice it but it became a thing and narco culture was the thing that the, the local government started fighting with you know they wanted to change the whole thing because what happened is that guys wanted to become the next Pablo and then girls wanted to become the next Pablo's girl you know what I mean so it was a it was a it was a yeah, it was crazy, it was crazy. The whole thing was a uh, all uh, like, um, how do you say that? Untal, well, immersed in this kind of dynamic. The local government realized something, maybe a little too late, but eventually they realized that the main cause for all of these issues that started happening <coughs> was the segregation <coughs> and the isolation of the peripheral regions. The fact that they didn't have any access to any other option that's what they went in uh, with violence, right? So if that was the cause, then the solution was connection. And that's when the Metro started playing such an important role. The main idea was to connect all of these peripheral regions with the main city, giving them just access to opportunities for them to choose, for them to have options. Um, but then the challenge was how to do that. You know, mountains have always been a challenge for us. We're all surrounded by beautiful mountains, but transportation has always been a challenge because of that. Look, very interestingly, we have always been an international referent in terms of transportation. So we face the biggest challenge and we came up with the biggest solutions. In terms of uh, the metro, so the metro started working, mm, two train lines from north to south and from the center to the west. That was it at that point. The plan was how to connect all of these mountains a train was not an option, I mean, a train doesn't get up there. They started considering different options. A tramway was one of those. Uh, they did build a tramway, but the tramway doesn't get to... There are some places that are so steep that not even a tramway was an option. So, they did build a tramway, but there were other places that still were uh, not connected. And that's when they came up with the brilliant, genius idea of using a cable line system as a massive transportation system, right? Normally, where would you see that kind of technology? Ski resorts, exactly, yeah. exactly, right? Uh, ski resorts, maybe tourism. In some places, they use it for tourists. 
this was the first city that decided to use that same technology but for massive transportation and it was such a success that they kept going right today we have six different cable line systems around the city uh, again as i told you we are an international reference i have worked personally with different groups from brazil and mexico groups of scholars you know university professors and mayors of different cities of brazil that came here to analyze how is it that the project went through you know what was the impact how was the process and everything for them to replicate now I know that Mexico has it, Brazil has it, Bolivia, Peru, <laughs> In the next video, we're gonna go up the cable cars and then go on the graffiti museum tour.